So what could Lincoln do anyway as president? What were the fears? They were not, they were not all that specific. Um, another historian, William Freeling, uh, excellent historian, has published a two-volume uh, work in the past 15 years called The Road to Secession. And he makes the argument that it was Southern disunity that helped propel the South to secession. In other words, that the lower South, the cutting edge of this, was very fearful about the upper South's loyalty to slavery, Virginia, Maryland. They were afraid that slavery was declining there, which it was, at least in, certainly in Maryland, somewhat in Virginia too, that they were more tied in day to day economically to the North, that if the South didn't secede now, slave states would peel off in the upper South and the lower South would become more and more isolated. And then he also says, as Ashworth has also said, there's the question of the slaves. We must not forget the slaves, which are a very large population. And, and certainly in South Carolina, 60% of the population are slaves. They have no voice in politics, but they are there, and their presence is known. And there's a fear that Lincoln's election will generate slave unrest. Not because Lincoln's going to be John Brown, but because slaves are aware of what is going on. You know, the, one of the biggest slave rebellions in the Caribbean, the, in 1831, in the island of Jamaica, was inspired by rumors that the, because Parliament was debating abolition then, rumors spread among the slaves that Britain had actually abolished slavery and that it was being sort of kept from, you know, the planters were keeping that knowledge from Jamaica, and that was one of the inspirations for this rebellion. Well, what are slaves going to, when Lincoln's elected and starts talking against slavery, what is that, what effect is that going to have on the slaves in the South? Nobody knows, but nobody could be sure either. If you look at the, you know, just like in the American Revolution, the southern states, as they seceded, sort of put forward declarations of independence or declarations of the causes of secession. They gave speeches about it. If you read them, you will see what was on their mind. They were pretty straightforward about it. They didn't beat about the bush. Read in the Janap book the famous cornerstone speech of Alexander Stevens once he goes with secession. Slavery is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. No beating about the bush. Pretty clear. They don't talk about constitutional theories. They don't talk about the tariff. They talk about the future of slavery. South Carolina, the first, of course, Declaration of the Causes of Secession. This is what the South Carolina Declaration of the Causes of Secession said. By the way, the first thing I would point is, like the Declaration of Independence, it's mostly a list of grievances. Grievances against the North, not against King George III. The longest grievance, the longest paragraph in the list of grievances has to do with fugitive slaves, has to do with the North impeding the return of fugitive slaves. This is an illustration of Ashworth's point that slave resistance is part of the formula, the, the situation here. It is not the whole story by any means, but it is part of the, part of the story. Um, we affirm that the ends for which this government was instituted have been defeated, and the government itself has been made destructive of them by the action of the non-slaveholding states. These states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions. In other words, they've criticized slavery. They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted the open establishment among them of societies whose object is to dis disturb the peace of the citizens of other states. This agitation has now secured to its aid the power of the common government. All right, this is the Charleston Mercury. The Union is dissolved. See that? December 20th, 1860. No distinction between abolitionists, Republicans. You see, the abolitionist movement now has the federal government on its side. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union. All the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of president whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. His opinions. This is the problem. The opinions of the North. What, how are you going to change that? Um, experience has shown that slave-holding states cannot be safe 
in subjection to non-slave holding states cannot be safe. In spite of all disclaimers to the contrary, there can be only one end by the submission of the South to the rule of an anti-slavery government in Washington, and that end, directly or indirectly, must be the emancipation of the slaves of the South. That is the problem. So what are they complaining about? Anti-slavery sentiment is what they're complaining about, now ensconced in Washington. Can this be compromised? Pretty difficult. But also interesting in this is the geographical line drawn across the Union in the election. We saw that. Why is it an election that triggers the crisis? Why wasn't it John Brown's raid? They, oh my God, look at this, we got to get out of here, you know? No, it's an election. Let us go back to the founding of the Constitution, to James Madison, to Federalist Number 10, which lays out the principle of American government. You know, Madison is, Madison is addressing the, the, the issue that all the republics in history, with the countries without a monarchy of representative governments, have been very small. You know, the Dutch Republic, et cetera, et cetera. When they get too large, like the Roman Republic, they collapse or they turn into monarchies or empires or something. Doesn't a republic have to be small? This is a gigantic country. Madison says, no, it's the opposite. The larger the country, the more stable the republic. Why? Because the larger the country, the more interest there will be, the more differing interests. No one interest will ever be able to take over the government. Every majority will be a coalition of minorities, and therefore they will protect the right of other minorities. So you cannot have an oppressive system in a large republic because no one group will ever take over. But this is what happened in 1860. One interest took over. The northern, that's how, the, that's how they're seeing it. The basic rule, rules of the democratic game, according to South Carolina, have been violated by Lincoln's election. Respect for heterogeneity has been abandoned. The northern states have united together to take over the government. That is why Charles Francis Adams, in an editorial uh, at this time, in the Atlantic Monthly, I think it was, says, the crime of the North is the census of 1860. What does he mean by that? The election, the census, it shows the North bigger, more populous, growing faster, the South is now a permanent minority. That's what Lincoln's election shows. It's a permanent minority, and the majority can run the country without any support. Without a vote in the South, they can take over the government. That changes the rules of politics. So the election, it's not just that li what Lincoln is going to do the day he's inaugurated. It's what this election means for the structure of power. It's a fundamental shift of power within the political system. 